So welcome back to the continuation of this series on our exploration of Indian civilization. And um, today we start this second series with a look at India's ecological traditions. Um, what we mean by that is the way ancient India has looked at nature and the components of nature and the problem of drawing, of course, resources from nature, but at the same time protecting it. The same problems, basically, that we are facing today, uh, of course, in a far more acute manner. And um, I thought that, I've all, because I've been personally a little involved in nature conservation work in India, uh, I've been sensitive to this. How did ancient India look at those problems? And <clears throat> we were, when we lived in the Nilgiris for Tamil Nadu for more than uh, 20 years, we were part of a movement to save uh, native forests, uh, which are tropical, moist, uh, um, uh, perennial forests there. And <clears throat> we understood that there was a kind of a disconnect, which I will come to towards the end of my talk, uh, a disconnect in India between the way people um, worship nature and this, of course, will be the first part of the talk, and yet in practice uh, mistreat it, so when it is perfectly avoidable. So this is um, a, a major problem we have to confront, and we can confront it, I think, more usefully if we are aware of what those uh, previous traditions, and not always ancient, many of these traditions are still living in many ways, and that, of course, you will recognize as we proceed, uh, but how did they work on what concepts were they based and uh, what kind of people were actually uh, practicing them. So let us start this <clears throat> exploration first of all by reminding ourselves that India is a land where agriculture has always been of very great importance. We saw that briefly in earlier lectures. Uh, in fact, it would have been interesting to have a whole lecture exclusively on, on uh, the past of Indian agriculture, but uh, let me remind you that uh, we find uh, uh, very, very early practices of agriculture in India, among the earliest in the world. Uh, this is at Mehergar in Baluchistan, for instance, where wheat, barley, millets uh, is proved to have been in cultivation uh, well before 6000 BC, possibly 7000 BC. So, uh, this is the, the beginning of the uh, settled sedentary uh, societies which will gradually spread to other parts of India, though of course each region will create its own independent tradition. For instance, if you look at the Ganges, uh, we have more or less in the same period of time, we have now evidence of rice cultivation. There's a bit of a debate between the paleobotanists, uh, as they are called, whether this rice is still wild or domesticated. But anyway, let us leave that uh, for the experts to sort out. Uh, but the fact is that rice was, was grown, harvested, uh, and uh, probably there were already uh, settled settlements. In, and these are uh, names, most of them in the uh, Allahabad region. <coughs> Lahura, they were, I think, is closer to Gorakhpur. So this is also a very ancient tradition and it will evolve gradually towards, uh, uh, and in fact, interestingly, those two regions, the, the northwest of India, which will be uh, where the Indus civilization will take shape in the third millennium BC, and the Ganges Valley are going to exchange their traditions and rice is going to migrate to the northwest while wheat and barley are going to enter the Ganges Plains. The exact days and mechanisms, again, are still being debated, but it seems to happen, all of it, during the Harappan or the late Harappan <coughs> phase. In, the, in South India, <coughs> in South India, things apparently develop later, although, you know, all these dates are always subject to uh, alteration by new findings, of course, and it's only about 3000 BC or so that uh, the first Neolithic settlements uh, are noticed in South India. So as, a, as of now, 
Uh, so Neolithic is the, the time, the period when settled agriculture takes place. Uh, here, initially, it is all about uh, millets and pulses. Uh, and uh, uh, rice will come much, much later. Wheat and barley also. So this agriculture is going to be, of course, the foundation of Indian civilization in all those regions. And um, therefore, it's not surprising that uh, there is a special importance attached to nature. It is the same naturally in all ancient civilizations. But there is something a little different which is going to happen in India, and which I'll show you shortly. This is one slide I had already shown about the various crops <coughs> that develop uh, during the second millennium and first millennium BC in the Ganges Valley. So you can recognize some of them. And um, uh, this, this shows, of course, the, this shows the uh, richness of the environment, uh, the, the fact that it was fairly easy to cultivate all those crops uh, led to the uh, creation of agricultural surpluses. And that was one of the essential conditions for the rise of civilization. So this is an extremely brief review of agriculture. But we must not forget that it's not all about crops. It's also about domestication of animal species. And here we have some evidence, uh, some of it direct, some indirect. Direct in the form of bones, for example, bone remains from various uh, animal species in, in uh, uh, many parts of India. But also indirect, like here, for example, the Indus seals tell us that this magnificent humped bull, the first two seals at the top, uh, was uh, uh, an animal which was part of the uh, Harappan uh, uh, you know, farming practices. And it, it's extremely well described on those tiny seals, which I remind you are usually no bigger than one inch or one and a half inch, exceptionally something like two inches in dimension. And on the right, you can see the uh, a humpless bull, which was also part of the Harappan repertoire. Now, the, there are also evidences of domestication of all kinds of other animals. This is the elephant. And you can see uh, that there is a decorated uh, uh, kind of saddle, which seems to indicate, and there are many such seals, seems to indicate that the elephant might have been domesticated in Harappan times. And uh, some bones are indeed found in Harappan settlements. So then, of course, well, the dog, much easier to domesticate, to tame. Uh, and you can see the, the, the <laughs> collar that goes with it. Monkeys, possibly also. But in addition, uh, goats, sheep, foals, um, uh, pigs, rabbits, monkeys, mongooses, peafowl, and cranes, etc. So a whole, uh, I mean, it is a very uh, developed agriculture. And uh, uh, at the same time, <coughs> uh, there are concepts that are going to take shape in India. Again, I'm not trying to place the respective relative chronology of Harappan civilization with regard to the Vedas. That's another question. But when we come to the Rig Veda, which is this uh, uh, manuscript here, we have very clear concepts of nature which correspond to a certain philosophy that is going to shape future attitudes of India towards nature. The first is the comparison <coughs> of the universe with a tree of 1,000 branches. So it is, of course, an image, it's a metaphor. But uh, to me, it is a metaphor for what we call unity in diversity. Uh, a tree is something that has one trunk, so there is a unity. You cannot you know, cut that trunk and, and get away with it. But it has a very great diversity of branches, all of which are connected to the trunk, but all of which are also different from each other. So it's a, it's a very beautiful and apt symbol. <coughs> but then the second is very important. <coughs> <clears throat> it is a fact that, like in all other religions, uh, heaven is our father. But unlike all other religions, uh, the earth is our mother. And this is something that is common in Asian re religions and thought systems, or in uh, re religious cultures, for example, of Native Americans, 
and many pre-Christian uh, religions. But <clears throat> with the Bible, <clears throat> this concept disappears. And Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in particular do not share the fact that, you know, the concept of Mother India. It does not exist. Um, and in fact, uh, if you look at the Veda, uh, there is another concept where, where the <clears throat> earth and heaven, the Ava Prithvi, are united in a single deity. This is very important. And they are worshipped as one, one God. So you have to translate as heaven hyphen earth. And this again is completely different from Judaism, Christianity and Islam because there earth and heavens are put on totally different levels. And especially uh, God, the God, because there is one God in those religions, um, is completely uh, above and separated from uh, the creation. So uh, the difference is, is important because in these religions, like those that derive from the, the, the Veda, uh, earth is sacred and put on the same level as <clears throat> the, the, divine, the, the divine realm, the, the realm of the gods, but not in the uh, um, monotheistic religions. So this is important to note. And uh, they are parents of the god, they are uh, twins, <clears throat> so you see it's, it's not only that uh, they are one, but they are twins. Uh, and they together, they keep all creatures safe. We'll come back to this. Uh, you have many other texts, I, it's impossible to quote all of them, I've just taken a very limited selection, where, for example, in the Atharva Veda, which is the fourth and last Veda, and much later than the Rig Veda, possibly a thousand years later, we don't know, there is a beautiful uh, Bhumi Sukta, <coughs> or hymn, to the earth, where again you feel this sense of reverence for the earth, and it reads, upon the immutable vast earth supporting by the law, that is to say what today we would translate as dharma, the universal mother of the plants, that is to say the earth, peaceful and welcoming, may we walk forever. So it is a prayer that we should, you know, we, we should walk forever on this, uh, this our mother. May we glorify you, O earth, in villages and the open land and assemblies and gatherings across the world. So there is a great reverence for this um, uh, planet, which is our mother. And <coughs> of course, <coughs> she is depicted in many art forms. This is from a temple in Tamil Nadu where you see um, uh, Bhudevi, the consort of Vishnu. Of course, the, the, the principal consort of Vishnu is Lakshmi, and she is here also, but she is hidden in the left corner. Uh, on, in this corner here is, is Bhudevi. And they are equal. It is not as if Lakshmi, <coughs> who let us say is the Divine Mother, is superior in any way to Bhu, the, the earth. They, there is no such concept. They are, the, the, in fact, the very fact that Vishnu has these two wives, with quotation marks, is precisely to mark the point that uh, the, the, the divine creation and the earth, the, the, this creation, are again on the same level. They are not, one of them is not regarded as superior to the other. So this leads to a lot of symbols. And <clears throat> uh, in particular, uh, I'm taking two, three, two or three of them. Let me begin by the symbol of the cow. You know, we, we say, Hindu worship cows and sometimes it becomes an object of ridicule and as always we just take the outer manifestation but we forget the real meaning, the, the, the symbolic meaning which is behind. So uh, here you have a, a depiction, a popular depiction of Kama Dhenu, also sometimes called Surabhi, in fact this is for you, and, uh, but uh, this is the concept of the uh, the divine cow that fulfills all our uh, desi desires, our prayers, but also contains the whole creation. You can see all the gods contained in this cow. But it is not again only, and we have the same, we come ac across the same twin concept at work here. It is not just the divine cow, there is also cow as the earth. And there is a beautiful long passage in the Mahabharata where the uh, the, the earth <coughs> is explicitly stated to be, uh, that she has become a cow. And all creatures 
go to her one after another, including the devas, including the asuras, uh, the snakes, and all of them, and of course humans, <coughs> go to her to milk her. So we, we go to the earth, we milk the earth, we take the, you know, the, the whatever nourish, nourishes us from the earth, and um, it is, in fact, something that many ecologists have gone back to, you know, saying that uh, let us uh, milk the earth, let us take whatever the, the, the nourishment the earth give us, but let us not kill the cow that, that produces this milk. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, there and quite clear in the ancient literature. And it, is, it takes many other manifestations. You know the story of Krishna, and the, the kind of uh, love story between Krishna and the cows, uh, which is depicted in, in particular in the <coughs> Bhagavata Purana. And uh, uh, it is not just a pretty bucolic kind of little story. There is, again, the same meaning behind. It is nothing but the love story between the creator, here symbolized uh, through Krishna, and the creation, the cow, the earth. So, the, so the, the cow, when we say Hindus are cow worshippers, what should really be said is that Hindus worship the earth, worship the creation, which is slightly different matter. <coughs> now we have a look at the animals. And uh, uh, well, I have already shown you in Harappan art uh, the bull and uh, the elephant and many others, but there are also mythical animals like this one. This is the Harappan unicorn, a kind of partly bull-like animal um, with a single horn. There was no such uh, animal in actual reality. So this is an abstract concept. Unfortunately, the meaning of which is going to remain speculative. There are many, many theories uh, until we can decipher the Harappan script, which you see here above. Uh, it will all remain speculations. But of course, some speculations may be better than others. Uh, there are other uh, very mysterious seals where you see those two unicorns emerging from a tree. Now, a tree, of course, again, is, is a concept of nature. And uh, all we can say is that this is the people tree. You know, the, the, in Sanskrit, it is Ashwatha. And um, uh, very interestingly, Ashwatha is also <coughs> a sacred tree in the Rig Veda in particular, and in, in the whole of later Indian traditions, but right from the Rig Veda. So there is here some connection between Harappan beliefs and, and uh, Vedic concepts. Anyway, without going into this, <coughs> you have other scenes like this one, <coughs> where you can see this uh, famous seated yogic uh, uh, figure with three faces, uh, kind of apparently mastering those four powerful animals, the tiger, uh, the, uh, this is the elephant, I think, and the buffalo here, I'm sorry, the buffalo and the rhinoceros. The rhinoceros was present in quite a few Harappan sites. Uh, the animal bones have been found, uh, which incidentally uh, seems to show that the climate was a little more congenial in those days. But anyway, uh, this is a, 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 a use of animal symbolism. Once again, we cannot uh, say clearly what, I'm sorry, what it is supposed to mean. And more mythical creatures, uh, these are with uh, three heads sharing a common body. And uh, there are differences, interestingly, but <laughs> we wish again we knew what it means. This is the humpless bull, this is the unicorn, and this is an antelope. But here we have two antelopes, and, <clears throat> and then uh, you have the bull instead here. So <clears throat> do, do these represent some myths or legends? Do they represent some deities? Do they represent more prosaically regions of the uh, Indus civilization? Because those uh, uh, seals were used in the context of trade. So, well, again, lots of speculation and theorism. Again, some more reasonable than others. You are familiar, of course, with the use of animals uh, uh, as uh, vahanas, the, the vehicles of the gods. So this is a slightly different <coughs> symbol, because here what is expressed is that the, the god, the, 
the di a particular divine power like Indra here uh, uh, is actually combined with a particular animal and you I would like to show how systematically the thing is done and that is usually not quite realized this of course is the elephant Airavata um, <coughs> Indra's Vahana and we have then uh, the bird uh, uh, Garuda for Vishnu we have <coughs> even a small mammal that is uh, Ganesha on the rat. Now it sounds perfectly ridiculous to have an elephant riding a rat. Uh, uh, if you lose sight of the symbol, of course it would. Uh, this is supposed to mean the rat is about you know small destructive forces of nature and uh, it is supposed to express the fact that uh, they also have to be uh, not only they are also part of this creation, but they have to be mastered, they have to be controlled. So this is what Ganesha is trying to do. <clears throat> and then uh, I will come back later uh, to, uh, in another context, I will show you the uh, crocodile or gharial and the um, tortoise. So we have, uh, we have mammals, big and small, from the elephant to uh, the rat with, of course, lions, tigers in between. Durga, for example, rides the tiger, sometimes the lion also, among other animals. We have the, 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 the reptiles, like uh, uh, tortoise, and we have birds. So there is an attempt, obviously, to include the whole uh, creation in these um, <coughs> vahanas. Uh, other animals come in different forms, uh, the symbols are not always so easy to decipher. This is the Naga Nagini uh, couple found in many uh, parts of many temples in India. And uh, well, they are obviously powers of nature uh, uh, represented in some form. The, the snake is a very powerful symbol in, in many ancient civilizations. Uh, it's an animal that uh, expresses not only uh, vigor, vitality, but also is supposed to have always secret occult powers. Uh, in India, the snake, the Naga, is very often the guardian of treasure. <clears throat> and there are legends about that, and even superstitions. You know, sometimes when uh, people spot a snake, uh, they are tempted to dig for treasure. So anyway, <clears throat> this is just to say that um, these animals are uh, very often depicted uh, in art, in Indian art. And they, there is a whole uh, uh, symbology behind all of them. Flora also, and to start with, I go back to the Indus civilization, where we can see uh, all kinds of uh, plants and trees depicted. I've already shown you the people, and the, this is the, the seal I showed you. This is a god here. Emerging, there's a kind of ceremony which I won't try to interpret for, for today uh, going on. Uh, obviously an invocation of this god and he stands between two branches of people tree. And you see here another god standing under an arch consisting of people leaves. <laughs> so this uh, Ashwatha, this people again is extremely important. We have various other symbols which are often difficult to interpret because, again, we cannot read the script. This, for instance, seems to be, on one uh, terracotta tablet, it seems to be a woman giving birth to a plant. There is a plant apparently emerging from her womb, and if in that case, uh, it would represent uh, uh, Mother Earth, the, the, the Earth or nature, giving uh, the mother of the of the plants, as the Atharva Veda was saying. Now, things become much clearer when we deal with the tree. And again, there is often, uh, you know, uh, it is often said that Hindus are tree worshippers as if it is meant to be derogatory. I don't see exactly what is derogatory about worshipping trees. We need them very much. But the fact is that there is a deeper symbol behind that. And um, you see here, typical view, that, a typical sight that will face you in many parts of India where you see this uh, a tree decorated with red powder and strung with strings which, as you know, uh, uh, are so many prayers that the worshippers have brought here. 
But why should we address prayers to a tree in particular? And the Mahabharata answers, uh, no, actually, well, for, uh, yeah, this is in the second part. Uh, we have the, again the heavenly tree, which corresponds to the heavenly cow which we saw earlier, that is Kalpavriksha or Kalpataru, and they, like this cow, fulfill all our wishes. But this Mahabharata gives the key when it says that he who worships the Ashwatha worships the universe, nothing less than that. So we have here a, a, a symbology that equates the <coughs> tree with the universe. And in fact, it is rooted in the Rig Veda, in what we saw earlier, that the, the universe is a thousand branch tree. It, is, it comes from, from there, but it is now in a more explicit uh, um, form. So this is, uh, this is again, if you remember some of you who were there in the talk I gave on uh, some principles behind Indian architecture, where we saw that there was at every step an, an effort to you know, embed the universe in forms. So you embed the universe in the form of even a humble uh, a brick fire altar, or in a magnificent temple, all of these can be images of the universe. But then here we find again the same preoccupation where the tree becomes a symbol for the whole universe. So of course now it makes sense that we should have these strings or these prayers tied to it. Of course people may have forgotten, most of the time will have forgotten the deeper symbol behind. Or when you are asked in a temple to circumambulate you know, the tree, the Sthalavriksha in particular, that is to say the sacred tree that is often associated to a particular temple. I'm not very, very sure in North India how far it is frequent, but in South India almost every single temple has a, a Sthalavriksha or a sacred tree. Well, that is the meaning, that is the, the symbol behind. <coughs> this is a Harappan tablet showing uh, again a, a tree being worshipped and quite explicitly because of this platform, this platform, and this will be used in later classical Indian art also, shows that you are giving a special status to whatever is on the platform, so that tree in particular. So reverence for trees, and it continues in many forms apart from the, the trees uh, uh, which are worshipped directly. For example, here in Buddhism, the tree is equally important, just as important as in Hinduism, and the symbols are pretty much the same. Here, for instance, you have a scene known as the adoration of Buddha's throne or seat. This is Buddha's seat. And initial uh, Buddhist art, there was a convention that the Buddha should never be represented. It's only after a few centuries that the first explicit depictions of the Buddha began. But initially, there was a kind of a uh, either a shyness or a, a reluctance to give him, you know, a, a, phys a human appearance because, of course, he was supposed to be something beyond. So you you have these worshippers here, worshiping. In other words, the presence of the Buddha. This is what they worship, not the actual seat, of course. But what do you see behind the throne, you see, or the seat? You see a tree, and this tree, which is the Bodhi tree, is actually the Ashwatha, the same. People tree, the, the Bodhi is nothing but a people tree, nothing else. Ficus religiosa, if you want the botanical name. So the same tree is, is sacred to the Hindus, the Buddhists, and actually also to the Jains. And uh, what does it mean here? Why should the, the Buddha be so uh, uh, associated with trees in such a manner? Simply because, again, the tree is a symbol for the universe. And what this is telling us is that, is that the, the Buddha's realization, illumination, is a, a cosmic realization, nothing less than that. This is the meaning of this tree behind this uh, people tree. So then we can begin to understand those symbols a little better. <coughs> and lots of sayings, lots of texts, uh, it would be endless to quote them all, to fill a whole book, in fact. But I like this uh, particular Subhashita. You know, Subhashitas are small, concise proverbs or sayings in Sanskrit. Uh, well, they exist in every Indian language, in fact, uh, which, uh, which contain a lot of ethical teaching and uh, 
very useful morals. Uh, uh, you know, it's a pity that uh, they, sh they are not uh, taught at school in particular because uh, we would learn a lot through them. Look at this one. Trees are like good people. While they themselves stand in the scorching sun, they provide shade and fruit for others. So here the tree becomes a symbol of selflessness, altruism, you know, sharing uh, uh, with others. So this is uh, uh, one uh, different level. And <coughs> if you read texts like Mahabharata and Ramayana, I, I have not gone into it because, again, it, it is, the, the material is too rich. But you will remember the exiles, respectively, of the Pandavas and of Rama, Sita, Lakshmana. And these exiles always, when you read those parts of those epics, always contain very rich description of the forest, the forest life, the plants, the flowers, the seasons, of course the animals and so on and so forth. So it is quite endless. There are hundreds of pages, literally speaking, so many that some people like these researchers of the uh, C.P. Ramasamy Aya Foundation in Chennai um, uh, have, under the direction of Dr. Nandita Krishna, this uh, Dr. Amitra Lingam and Dr. Sudhaka, have recently produced a book where they have actually compiled all the flora uh, listed in the Ramayana. And uh, all of, almost all of which can be readily identified with proper botanical names, and that's what they've done. Uh, but then they've not stopped at that. They have categorized it into various kinds of forests that uh, this flora belongs to. And they find that uh, there is a, a, um, the, all the various kinds of forests which are described in the book, like this alpine semi-forest system, uh, this um, uh, Chitrakut is a tropical deciduous forest. Then you, when you move to the south, tropical dry uh, deciduous, this will be semi uh, deciduous, moist deciduous forest. And finally, when you come to Lanka. And in fact, all the descriptions match extremely well the succession of these different types of forests. So there's a whole little book which came out uh, just a couple of months ago. And uh, uh, it's an interesting, different way of looking at the epics, which show that there's always room for new uh, perspectives and new research. And, and if, if uh, this is uh, accepted, then it would confirm, not only it would confirm that somebody whether it is Rama or else, of course, is a different issue, but somebody traveled all the way to the south and noted carefully the various kinds of flora available in those regions. So this is quite interesting. <coughs> uh, since we are in the south, let us stay there for a second and uh, give this quotation of the Kural. You know, Thiruvalluvar, the author of the Kural, uh, this is a uh, Again, a compendium of 1,339, if I remember correctly, uh, kurals or aphorisms. And uh, they are uh, usually, they are, well, they, are, they deal with subjects like uh, ethics, economy and wealth and love. Uh, but then there are some surprising statements here and there, and this is one that concerns us today. Uh, sparkling water, open land, hills and forests constitute a fortress. Now, this is unusual fortress or a fort or anyway, a defense system. It's unusual, unexpected because uh, it, wouldn't, it shouldn't have been so clear at that time when, when nature was not threatened that uh, these, uh, uh, you know, these elements of uh, nature uh, are actually our defense. But this is exactly what he says. So very f uh, uh, insightful. Uh, view of Tiruvalluvar. Now, the rivers now, let us see uh, some constituents. I'm going to totally skip the mountains because it is too well known. We know that um, mountains in India are sacred. Uh, we know that various gods are associated with the mountain peaks. Uh, that is all right. But let us rather look at the rivers because in a way rivers are more essential. They are the life givers. They are what has actually, historically speaking, permitted the growth of civilization. <clears throat> Indian civilizations are river-based. And this 
reverence for rivers again starts from the earliest times. And uh, here we have in the Rig Veda the uh, list uh, which I have, I think, showed in a previous talk. But let me just show how from Ganga all the way to, uh, to Sindhu and to the Afghan tributary of the Sindhu, which today are called the Komal, the, um, this is the Kabul River, this is the Komal River, and this is the Kurum. Uh, and uh, all of these rivers are listed precisely from east to west, all 19 of them. None uh, are forgotten, uh, well, including the Sarasvati, of course, which has disappeared, but that's another story. So you can see that, and this is a, a hymn in praise of the river. Now, these two Sukta, so they are revered, they are praised, extolled, and uh, because, because, well, people are already quite aware <coughs> that rivers are ex of great importance to their survival. Sarasvati in is a special case because it is the one river that is transformed into a goddess, the f the first of all. The other uh, rivers in the Rig Veda are not. They are revered, but they don't turn into gods or goddesses. So she is the goddess of intuition, and uh, later on, in the Yajur Veda, she is the goddess of speech, Vaj. Uh, then, of course, we know her classical uh, avatar as a goddess of knowledge, education, arts, etc. And uh, she is so uh, important that even though she disappeared in the western, northwest of India, her memory was preserved by transferring her name to several other rivers. There are at least one dozen Sarasvatis in India, uh, but also. Uh, in invisible form to the Triveni Sangam of uh, Allahabad. So uh, this, was, this is, of course, a, a case when a river becomes something more. But the reason why rivers are taken, most of them as goddesses, with, with one or two exceptions, of course, Brahmaputra uh, is one exception because Brahmaputra is a god, not a goddess. But otherwise, all rivers are goddesses, I including all the way to South India, the Kaveri, for example. So the, the, the reason for clear it is that uh, th the same uh, association between the earth, the creation, the cow, now we have the river, and all of these are mothers. So rivers also are mothers, and uh, 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 Sarasvati in particular is Ambitame, among other things. She is the best of mothers. So these concepts are running through in a very consistent manner. This is what I'm trying to uh, convey. And of course, after uh, uh, Sarasvati has disappeared and after the Vedic time properly speaking, during which Ganga and Yamuna just figure very briefly. In the Rig Veda, Ganga and Yamuna are of no particular importance, they are just mentioned, that's all. But then we know how in later times uh, they grow in stature and they become uh, full-fledged goddesses in their own uh, right. And this is Ganga because of the uh, Gharial, you know, the Gangetic crocodile, which is a uh, Vahana. You can see that these are rivers because of the, the pot that they are carrying. The, there was actually the same pot I forgot to show uh, here, Sarasvati, depicted in a South Indian temple. Uh, the, this is what tells you that this is a river, you see. She is also, she's also holding the Vedas in her hand. This is a palm leaf manuscript symbolizing the Vedas. So she is also the mother of the Vedas, but that is the uh, divine counterpart of the symbol. What is her vehicle? Sarasvati vehicle is the swan, same as Brahma. Uh, they, they share it, and, uh, but in, in the Veda, speaking, there is no concept of vehicle. It comes in the Puranas, basically. <coughs> Ganga Yamuna, and, uh, and of course Ganga becomes the all-important uh, river because it is the mother of the Gangetic civilization. Uh, it, uh, this, uh, de then there is a whole mythology associated with the descent of the Ganges. You know the story here you have, for example, Bhagirath depicted in Mahabalipuram in, in Tamil Nadu doing his penance to bring down the Ganges. And, uh, and you know the importance for the communities of uh, sadhus and uh, sannyasins uh, who do not mind braving the cold 
uh, as long as they can be as close as possible to the sources of the river. Uh, I mention this also because uh, I have noticed personally, well, you, you, you know, especially here at IIT Kampur, all the efforts uh, past and present uh, that go into saving uh, Ganga. But uh, I have noticed in the past 10, 15 years, maybe 20 years, that more and more uh, spiritual figures, uh, sannyasi and sadhus, have actually uh, wake, woken up to the, the urgency of saving the river and have started contributing in various ways, which was not the case previously. They were you know, not really connected uh, uh, decades ago with the, those environmental problems. So they are coming into that, which I think can only help in, in creating more awareness because uh, they have such immense following. So this is, um, of course, the Kumbhamela, one of them, uh, not even Maha Kumbhamela, and this is 1968. So you can see that uh, uh, there have been for a long time huge crowds. Uh, let us not forget that uh, uh, in uh, uh, this year, I think it was this year in Arahabad, we had 100 million people gathering, uh, 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 10 crore people gathering over something like three weeks. And uh, uh, the whole, you know, the whole thing is so mind-boggling that Harvard University sent uh, students from six of its schools to study the logistic of it all because for them it was just impossible to imagine such uh, uh, huge gatherings. You know, when even during a single day sometimes you would have actually three million people taking bath during a single day. So, you know, in the U.S. when you have 1,000 people, it's a mammoth <laughs> gathering. You can imagine when they heard about 100 million people what it meant for them. So they, did, they sent those teams and I believe they have produced quite a thick uh, report about the whole logistics of it. I mean, it's good that somebody, uh, Indians or, or, or non-Indians, whatever, uh, should study those, uh, those phenomena. Uh, there are other uh, concepts associating nature uh, in, uh, you know, with, with the human being in unexpected ways. And this is the Ayurvedic concept. The philosophy behind Ayurveda is actually, again, something that connects the human body with the universe and its functionings, or nature and its functionings. So uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but uh, you have here the... The, four, the five elements, you know, the pancha mahabhutas, ether, earth, water, fire, and air. Uh, these are the five elements of nature. And then you have the, the functions, the, the three functions, the three dosha, as they are called, uh, uh, which uh, make the whole universe work in the Ayurvedic philosophy. Uh, but then they are the same in the human body. Now, it may look like a nice little philosophical system, but don't forget that uh, the Ayurvedic treatments and medicines are actually prepared according to this uh, philosophy in which uh, if any of these uh, functions and elements uh, uh, grows out of balance or reduces out of balance, then we are going to fall sick eventually. So sickness, disease in Ayurveda is nothing but an imbalance between those principles and the actual treatments and medicines are designed to restore this um, equilibrium. So, so this is, this is uh, uh, a case where uh, you know, the, the, the view of nature has directly resulted into uh, an actual uh, scientific practice. Uh, not only for the human body, but when we look at protection of nature directly, uh, because all these concepts I have explained before, well, you may say they are all very nice, but how does it translate into practice? Well, it did translate a lot into practice, uh, even uh, more than uh, what I have shown for Ayurveda. And uh, the thing is that we have a whole science, and this is Vriksha Ayurveda, a whole discipline of Ayurveda, where you deal with plants and trees. And the, the, we have, there are several texts which give recipes, first of all, identifications of all particular diseases affecting uh, plants, trees, crops, and uh, pro uh, proposing recipes. And some of these recipes have been tested 
uh, by uh, people who, especially in the field of agriculture, and they've been found to be quite effective. So there is still quite a bit of scope here to learn from the ancient texts uh, with very practical applications. Uh, apart from that, there will be uh, my next talk, which is next uh, week, will be about water structures. So I will not spend much time on this today. I just want to show how the texts um, uh, make it clear that uh, the, the dedication of a tank is more meritorious than that of a hundred wells. This is from Mahabharata. Uh, more meritorious means you will earn a hundred times more punya if you dig a tank than if you dig a well. And the reason is obvious. A well is something that takes, it draws water. But a, a tank is something that returns water to the water table, and which is therefore one way of encouraging people, you know, by promising them more punya uh, to dig uh, tanks rather than wells. And in the Shiva Purana, one of the many signs of the Kali Yuga is that the merchant class, the Vaishyas, have abandoned, you know, Kali Yuga is a very dark age where everything uh, falls apart and all the good uh, practices are abandoned, and one of them is this, that they have abandoned holy rites such as digging wells and tanks and planting trees and parks. So please note that these uh, digging wells, tanks, planting trees and so on are not just uh, ordinary activities, they are actually holy rites. They are, they are therefore regarded as sacred practices and um, uh, well maybe it is a way to encourage people to practice them but uh, whatever, in any case this is in, in consonance with the vision of nature as something sacred as I have already highlighted. Ashoka, if you look at his edicts, has quite a little bit on protecting nature and in particular because perhaps of his turn towards Buddhism, towards compassion for all creatures, uh, he explains in one edict that um, in his kitchen, in the kitchen of his palace, uh, almost all killing of animals uh, has been stopped. He says not quite, he says there is still, still a deer being uh, uh, killed once in a while and some uh, fall, uh, but um, otherwise he says we have uh, stopped eating meat. And um, here in addition he prescribes uh, uh, medical treatment for animals, including wild animals, when they are found hurt, and a prohibition of hunting and cruelty. So uh, this is something this, which is quite reflected in the text. For example, Arthashastra. I think I'm not going to read this, uh, uh, these excerpts in full. Uh, let me simply say that Arthashastra prescribes the establishment of animal parks, what today we would call wildlife sanctuaries, you know, where animals will be protected they will not be allowed to be hunted. Uh, they will be guards, uh, foresters, and um, uh, if anyone is found uh, slaying an elephant, you know, poaching an elephant, uh, he should be put to death. Um, this is not only because the elephant is regarded as a very majestic animal and, and uh, uh, you know, to be respected like all animals, but also there is a, here a utilitarian purpose, which is that elephants were the foundation of the army. And um, uh, the, you know, they were regarded really as the property of the king. So this goes on, and you know, all the fines for the uh, mistreatment, torture uh, given to animals are listed in great detail. So there is a, a deliberate will to, uh, to protect animals and uh, plants, in fact. Um, this is the protection of plants given in another text, Manushmriti, which is probably a little older than Arthashastra, though, I mean, this is always difficult to say, and uh, where you have here for various injuries caused to plants, I mean, think of the context today when, uh, you know, this would, uh, <laughs> this seems quite unrealistic, but it, it, it was the case 2,000 years ago, more or less, or 2,500 years ago, where there are fines for felling live trees, if it is a dead tree, it's different, um, uh, for whatever reason it may be, for cutting firewood, for, of course, this needs to be qualified because, uh, again, dry wood would be perfectly well allowed. 
uh, fruit laden trees it would be regarded as even more criminal to cut to fell a fruit laden tree and um, uh, various other types of plants which uh, will be uh, basically crops so so all these uh, punishments are listed in great detail and again for this is still from Manushmiti but this is for the uh, uh, injuries given to animals or killing of animals and um, uh, especially uh, you, you see the, the fine increase with the nobility and size and of course usefulness of the animal so all these how far they were practiced actually is very hard to say because there are books of guidelines basically they are not uh, you know like our uh, code of law which is supposed to be enforced uh, these were not exactly texts that were supposed to be enforced they were more guidelines given to the society but the edicts of Ashoka and some other inscriptions here and there do uh, tell us that uh, uh, there was at least some practice in consonance with those texts. There's one very interesting, uh, since I mentioned Manushmiti here earlier, one interesting passage is which uh, shows, well, first of all, a kind of belief in met metampsychosis, you know, that people sometimes, humans, if they have sinned a lot, can go back in the evolutionary, evolutionary stage and uh, can take forms, uh, re rebirth back into animal forms or even into uh, plant forms if they have really sinned a lot. So this is a way to, to tell people that, you know, uh, human, uh, humans may be there, there you may be human presence even in plant. Um, so there, here what we have is, the, uh, uh, first of all, categories of plants. The plants are listed systematically among different categories. They're, it's not exactly our current botanical categories, but still there's an effort. Uh, those born from sprouts are all flora propagated through seeds or cuttings. Those that bear copious flowers and fruits and die after the fruits mature are plants. Those that bear fruits without flowers, traditions called forest laws, that is vanaspati. And those that bear flowers and fruits, tradition called trees. Various kinds of shrubs and thickets, thickets and different types of grasses as also creepers and vines, all these also grow from either seeds of cuttings. And now the critical sentence, wrapped in a manifold darkness caused by their past deeds, these, that is to say these uh, beings, come into being with inner awareness able to feel pleasure and pain. So what it says is that plants actually have awareness they can feel pleasure and pain, which is something that, you know, somebody like uh, Jagdish Chandra Bose, if you, some of you remember, uh, was trying to demonstrate through his many experiments, you know, that uh, plants have sensitivity, sensitiveness, they can react to stimuli, uh, and uh, they are not uh, uh, insentient beings, basically. Of course, here Manushriti, that is uh, uh, its own uh, concept, uh, puts it to the fact that uh, beings, higher beings have reincarnated as plants, but all right. But the fact is that they are, uh, it is conscious of this uh, awareness that plants have. When we come to more recent periods, we can see that those concepts have been practiced and uh, sometimes with dramatic effect. This is the case of the Bishnois, and the story of the Bishnois uh, is well known. <clears throat> it is a sect that was created, I think, in the 16th century by a guru who enjoined 29 principles of behavior on this sect, and 29 is Bishnoi, so hence the name of the sect. Uh, but then, about 200 years later, uh, there was a, the Maharaja of Jodhpur who needed wood uh, for various reasons including to build a palace and he sent his foremen to the Bishnoi villages uh, where they had protected uh, uh, trees uh, uh, quite effectively and they had a rich forest and uh, the, the woodcutters started filling the trees but then the, uh, the villagers uh, came to, the, uh, to protect the trees and um, hugged the trees at the cost of their lives and 363 villages beginning with one 
Amrita Devi and her three young daughters uh, uh, died uh, uh, chanting the, uh, the teaching of the Guru which enjoyed that if a tree is saved even at the cost of one's head it is worth it. So <clears throat> at some point the slaughter stopped and the Maharaja of Jodhpur apologized uh, later in an edict uh, which is still in force. This monument here, this is the, the, the Kejri tree which was being felled and this is a monument uh, in Rajasthan which uh, actually commemorates this event. It is a historical event and he, uh, because of course he had never wanted this to, to happen and uh, he um, uh, decreed that henceforth uh, all Bishnoi control lands would, uh, on, on these lands, animals and uh, trees would be uh, protected. Nobody would have a right to go and kill animals of, of fen trees. And you all know how, you know, some years ago a, a Bollywood star uh, was arrested for having poached black bucks, hunted black bucks in Bishnoi territories. And it was Bishnoi villagers who actually caught him. The law has not yet caught him, but that's another issue. Um, then, uh, well, uh, you know, it would be endless if we were, I'm just taking uh, very briefly one or two samples to, to simply to show you the, the depth of feeling that certain Indian populations have had for nature. Uh, this is a proud Toda tribal from the Nilgiris in Tamil Nadu. And um, these, this uh, particular tribe is rather exceptional in the, the depth and very systematic relationship with nature. With all plants that are available in the Nilgiris, they have a name for every single plant, which uh, even later settlers do not have. The, uh, in particular, the Tamil, Tamil settlers in the Nilgiris have just maybe one name for 10 plants. Most of them are unnamed. Uh, they use, in fact, though, those plants, they use those plants for very complex elaborate rituals. And if the, the plant for any reason dies out, vanishes, which does happen once in a while, uh, they, they just uh, uh, stop practicing the ritual. They do not try to replace it. <coughs> they are aware of the blooming patterns of all kinds of wildflowers, which they observed during the months preceding the arrival of the monsoon in particular, and they give predictions. There is something which exists in many parts of India, in fact, uh, and uh, there are many traditions uh, of weather prediction, some of which uh, have been documented through research papers. They even have uh, a timekeeping given by several flowers. There is one flower, for example, which opens precisely at 6 p.m. Uh, it's a primrose, basically. They have other uses for flowers, for example, there's a tiny little flower uh, which is a gentian, uh, a type of gentian, and which uh, they will pluck and put in your hand. We were witnesses uh, ourselves several times. And um, uh, the same flower put in the one hand uh, may close, while in somebody else's hand it will not close. So their explanation is that the person who has a lot of worry uh, holding this flower, the flower will close. And the more worries you have, the faster it will close. Uh, but if you are free from worries, uh, then it will remain open. The fact is that the flower behaves differently in the hands of different people. So they have all kinds of uh, traditions of this sort. And very interestingly, they are strict vegetarians, which is rare in India. There are very, very few tribes. The Bishnois are vegetarians, but they are not, they are not properly speaking a tribe. But otherwise, tribes are usually, and quite understandably, they are, they are hunters. So they, they hunt whatever they need, not more than that. So, but then they told us to live exclusively from forest produce, um, uh, uh, honey, and also produce uh, fruits of all kinds, and also produce from their uh, wild buffaloes. They keep, uh, they actually tame wild buffaloes, and they have herds of buffaloes. Uh, which give them a lot of dairy produce. Um, another important tradition is that of sacred groves. And you can see this map showing you where most of the uh, uh, sacred groves have been located in India, uh, quite a few in the south and following the western Ghats, uh, basically. 
but also Eastern Ghats, so Andhra, Orissa, West Bengal, and a little bit in Central India and Northeast also. What are those sacred groves? They are basically a small forest attached to a particular village uh, where the, the, the a community is in charge of this forest and there is a decree that no villager is allowed to enter the forest for woodcutting or for hunting. Other forests elsewhere are free you know, for access, but this grove will be protected. And some of them are just a few acres, others can extend it to many tens of acres. So uh, they've been studied and they've been found usually to be very rich for those which are not degraded because you know the tradition of course breaks down and uh, young villagers of course are not always interested in, in, in maintaining those traditions. But um, uh, when the uh, sacred groves are still in good conditions, a lot of botanical studies have been made and very often new species or new subspecies of plants have been discovered and uh, in particular a lot of uh, wealth of uh, uh, medicinal plants. So very rich biodiversity thanks to this centuries old tradition of sacred groves. This is one image from Tamil Nadu where uh, this is in a sacred grove where you have all these uh, votive horses uh, votive because prayers are again addressed to them uh, uh, in the same way as we saw before. And these terracotta figures, this is from Perambalu district, uh, you can see here the, the huge size of some of these horses, not like the previous slide. Uh, there is always a shrine uh, in uh, those sacred groves. And um, uh, this uh, statue, for example, here, this terracotta horse, will be ritually broken, smashed every year and replaced by another. And this is obviously a symbol for the death and rebirth of nature, you know, through the cycle of seasons. So uh, all these uh, rich traditions are there. They have been largely documented. They are unfortunately um, lost because of the, uh, well, the wave of modernism. So this brings me, and I will uh, conclude my talk with this, with, it brings me to what I call personally the great disconnect where we have this uh, very rich set of uh, concepts, philosophies, symbols, actual traditions and at the same time today it looks as if the average Indian, average of course, is possibly the least uh, environmental aware person in, in, in the world where you know we see uh, 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 in fact, whatever we can see in the cities and sometimes also in the villages is just uh, contrary to what we have seen. Uh, people will, you know, worship Ganga, but at the same time uh, pour tons of toxic effluents into, into it without a second thought, without, you know, associating the two things together. This is why I call it a disconnect. You have villagers worshipping snakes, but killing them in their field, even though it's a very useful animal. Uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So we also worship the mountains, but you know how we treat them. I mean, the, the, the Kedarnath, uh, last year's catastrophe in uh, uh, Uttarakhand is a very good illustration of the absolute plunder of mountains because it was not actually na a natural calamity. Yes, there was very intense and prolonged rainfall, but it was the, the denudation of the hills uh, it was the excessive number of dams, uh, you know, promoted by the dam lobby, but actually not required in such large numbers, which uh, compounded the disaster and made it so much worse. So, well, there are all kinds of dire prophecies. I think I'm going to, uh, uh, I don't have to read out all this. We are quite aware of them, uh, the, the, phase, the, the shape of things to come in terms of climate, in terms of disruption of monsoon, a possible decrease of agricultural yield and increase of uh, pollution. A decrease of water tables everywhere in India is, is uh, almost everywhere, uh, is uh, noted by, uh, thanks to the over-exploitation uh, of water for uh, agricultural purposes. And this becomes very severe in many parts of India because what happens when you deplete the aquifers is not just that your uh, wells run dry, is that you are actually bringing into the aquifers all kinds of salts from other uh, layers which normally were, were kept away by the pressure 
of water in the aquifer. So this is how a lot of undesirable salt leach into the, the aquifer and how water turns brackish. When it doesn't turn uh, you know, completely poisonous uh, with, for example, arsenic or, or other um, undesirable elements coming in. So we have uh, the situation in, in Ganges. It is so well known that I don't have to say anything. This is from an article in Time magazine four years ago showing the various points and I don't think things, matters have improved as yet. Let us hope they will. But the various points where uh, there is almost no Ganges uh, left, almost no flow left, through mainly excessive damming. And uh, in fact, there are still quite a few dams which are at the planning stage uh, on the Ganges. So this is something that the, the Ganges Authority and the various uh, commissions that are trying to save uh, and various groups of stakeholders that are trying to save Ganga uh, will have to confront. And uh, well, uh, this is of course a very critical um, problem because Ganga was precisely the symbol as well as uh, the, the feeder of the birth of India's classical civilization. So we have to wonder what happens if, if the river uh, ends up being seasonal as the current predictions go. Uh, it is possible that by 2050, I mean, the, the climatologists do not all agree. Some put it at the end of the 21st century. But as per current trends, the, the transformation of Ganges into a seasonal river is quite uh, unavoidable. Unless, of course, the trends are um, re uh, reversed. Now, there are, of course, all kinds of people, apart from the scientists who are working on these issues, uh, who have been concerned with such problems. So this is just to show you that not all traditions have died. For example, the Chipko movement of tree hugging, which did result in considerable uh, conservation of forests in the Garhwal region. Uh, there have been similar movements like this one in Orissa, where women actually, who often are more uh, you know, ecologically sensitive than men for obvious reasons, um, uh, started a movement of tying rakhis to the trees uh, and uh, protect the, the, uh, some forests from uh, timber mafias, and successfully so. So it is possible, of course, uh, Bahoguna, I know that uh, he has his detractors. I'm aware that uh, some people have criticized some limitations in his approach. Nevertheless, uh, I personally pay homage to such people who have uh, sacrificed a lot for preservation of uh, forests, forest tribes, rivers, and um, at least to create awareness. Uh, this gentleman here is Rajendra Singh, who has also been called the Waterman of Rajasthan. I'm just showing two or three of them. There are luckily many more and who has actually worked uh, on the eco-restoration of uh, some districts of Rajasthan simply by recreating uh, the, the basically the, the village pond, uh, the Johar, and interconnecting them. So 4,500 ponds have been revived and some rivers started flowing again, which is simply to show that it is, you know, even when things have turned to great aridity, desertification, it is never impossible to reverse the trend, but then we have to, to you know, put in a lot of effort, which unfortunately governments, state governments in particular, have failed to do. Anna Hazare is known for his uh, anti-corruption campaign, but long before that he was known for his eco-registration work in his village and surrounding district at uh, Raligaon Siddhi in Maharashtra. So he did a lot of work, uh, tree planting, uh, soil erosion, digging canals, uh, and more recently uh, bringing in solar power and biogas. And you know, these efforts have inspired many others. Another person I should mention is Anupam Mishra, who has also done uh, a lot of rainwater harvesting uh, in Rajasthan. So uh, they are environmentalists, they are also, all of them, these uh, whom I have shown, are also rooted in the uh, Indian traditions of, of nature conservation. So this is to show that there is you know, a certain stream uh, of uh, practice here. And I think that uh, if we are to reverse you know, the, the current trends, uh, it's very important to make use of such people who uh, have that 
um, uh, perception of what the ancient ecological traditions were. My conclusion, and this is also from my own practice, limited practice uh, in the Nilgiris, is that I would recommend five principles for, world, for nature conservation uh, if uh, we want uh, nature to be uh, preserved. Uh, one is to recapture the sense of sacredness of nature. It is uh, something that is quite absent, for example, uh, from our schools. Uh, if uh, we teach today ecology in schools, and it's excellent that we should do so, uh, I don't see why we should not take some of the elements I showed earlier in my talk to, to, to recreate this sense of reverence for nature. Uh, scientific ecology is absolutely needed, but uh, it alone will not you know, be sufficient to actually m create mass movements, mass following. Uh, remember that all creatures are interdependent. Uh, this is something that the, some texts like the Upanishads talk about. Uh, I, there was an article showing that the rate of disappearance of species has increased phenomenally in the last 50 years. I, I forget now the exact figures, it is a bit mind-boggling. So we may think that one particular species disappearing far away doesn't matter for us, but actually it's all one big chain. Third, naturally, is to keep our needs under control. Development, of course, is indispensable, but um, uh, excessive consumption uh, is uh, something that will certainly harm the planet. It has to, development has to respect the environment. Uh, this is something that all our politicians say all the time, but uh, they have no clue on how to go about this. So I think that they should work much more with environmentalists and not against environmentalists. And there are very uh, open-minded environmentalists. I can mention perhaps just as one case among many, uh, Sunita Narayan of the Center for Science and Environment. Uh, uh, she, she is someone who has consistently uh, promoted environmental causes, but while being very careful always to, pr to provide solutions. That is to say, to show that alternatives exist, which can resolve the problems uh, you know, for which we want this development to happen, uh, with, in a way that will not harm the environment or will harm it less. And finally, get involved before we get extinct. That is to say, you know, there's always something that all of us, even at a very humble level, can do. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that this can also make a huge difference. So this is a very brief journey through India's ecological traditions. And um, I think we will have to take back something of the spirit and sometimes the practices of it if we have to uh, face the looming environmental crisis in India, which is, I'm afraid, going to be very severe, is already very severe, perhaps. Uh, next week, we will see uh, a special topic un uh, within this, which is water structures, uh, where I will show you all the, uh, very briefly, not all, but most of the uh, important practices uh, that were at work in various regions of India through various methods to conserve water. So this is for today. Thank you very much.